please open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you do need a copy of the Scripture, there are a number of them available. They are the black uh, books that are in the chair racks. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you do need a Bible, you don't have one with you, just look around like you're desperate and you can't find something. And somebody will see it and they'll either hand you theirs or they'll grab you one and open it to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 for you. We want to have the Word of God open in front of us so that we know that what's preached is not merely opinion, but that it's authority, God's authority. And so here we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and if you'll do me uh, the favor of looking back to chapter 6, and I want to read uh, two verses in chapter 6, and then we'll begin reading in chapter 7. In chapter 6, the verse we're going to look back to is verse 16. And then we'll look at verse 18 as well. What? Know you not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. And then verse 18, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Now chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband, hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come again together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. But I speak this by permission, and not of commandment, for I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, and another after that. Now, we'll pray for God's help with our understanding tonight. God, we do need your help to understand the Scriptures. And God, I pray that you would in particular help us not to explain away the Scriptures instead of explain what is implicitly in the Scriptures tonight. And God, I pray that you would help us not to, again, teach what others are wrong about, but God, help us instead to find out what you say so we can be uh, so we can be in agreement with you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just remove the elements or aspects of pride or even uh, the responses that sometimes we have where we just have a preconceived notion and we are uh, prone to just defend our view rather than to try to ascertain what your view is. We want to know you. We want to know you better as a result of getting your word tonight. So that's what we ask your help in. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, uh, we really were in our context here. Last week, we looked specifically at something that, if you carefully read 1 Corinthians and you're reading through this portion, is as plain as the nose on your face and is really a flashing neon light. Literally, just an in-your-face thematic element that's in the text. And the thematic element is that in chapters 5 through chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, the Holy Spirit is dealing with the matter of fornication. And as a matter of fact, if you were to simply just take uh, and make a word list of every use of the word fornication in the Old and New Testaments, you'd see that the majority use is in this short, really just about uh, a full uh, page of your Bible left and right side, and a little bit more than that. And that's pretty incredible. In other words, if you were to ask, what's the emphasis of this portion of the Scripture, the plain emphasis of this portion of the Scripture is fornication. And so that ought to be a little bit of a, as again, a, a flashing neon sign to you to say, okay, what's God saying here? Well, obviously this matter of fornication is a major issue. And so then that ought to make it a, a, one of those things you say, okay, I'm going to delve into this. I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into the context and find out what the deal of fornication is. And so what you do, then, if you're going to study fornication, is you look it up in the Bible and you see where it's used in different places, and you'll go all the way back to uh, 2 Chronicles, 
And that's the first instance where it's mentioned. In the first instance of fornication being mentioned, it is mentioned uh, right at, or it is mentioned as part of Jehoshaphat's plan to get people, the people of Israel and Judah, to turn away from God. And it happened in the high places where alternative worship to God was established. And one of the things that you're reminded, as you see in the scripture, is that idolatry and fornication are like this. And it's, it's a little bit of an eye-opener, to be frank with you. A lot of times we think fornication, well, that's a physical sin, and we don't recognize the spiritual aspect of fornication. We don't realize that fornication and idolatry are like this. Literally, it is one of the major tools of the devil to turn you away from God. And truly, in practical experience, as we mentioned last week, I have many, on many occasions, uh, seen precisely what the Scripture is teaching carried out, maybe not even quite fully understood it. For instance, I've shared the Gospel with people and showed them uh, how simple it is to be part of God's plan for them to be reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, Jesus, on the cross. Friend, there is no greater demonstration of the love of God than the cross of Jesus Christ. I, you know, the thing that, as I, as I grow older, is more and more impressive to me is the reality that God loves sinners. You say, yeah, duh, okay, well, no, think about that. God loves sinners. <laughs> You know, in a time, a day, and age in our society when we're trying to find worth, self-worth, self-esteem in different places, uh, ultimately we realize that that's an attempted futility. Self-esteem is always a matter of comparison. It's a comparison with others, it's a comparison with ourselves, and it's just one of those endless uh, roads that you could go down and never get anywhere on. To qualify for love... We have to do something, or we have to be something, or worthy of something. But to qualify for God's love, we have to be ungodly. But God commended His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. You qualified for God's love? <laughs> hey, I, I'll join that club, right? The ungodly club, that's me. In other words, I know God loves me because not because I was good enough or performed or accomplished well enough that God said, okay, I can see you're serious about it. Maybe I'll extend the offer for eternal life to you. No. No one's ever been godly. And everyone that God loves is ungodly. Friend, you can rest in that truth. You can go and say, you know what? I don't have to be something for God to love me. But now I've shared the love of God with people in the, in the form of the gospel of Jesus. That though you're a sinner, and though uh, you deserve God's judgment, and though sin separates you from God, that Jesus, who never sinned, God's Son, died on the cross for your sin. And God has offered what Jesus did, death in our place, the substitutionary atonement. God's offered it as a free gift to whoever will call in the name of the Lord. I've shared that with people, and I've seen people moved by it by the Holy Spirit. I've seen the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, you know, you ever just share something with someone? And you, know, you can argue all kinds of things. You can just, based on wherever someone's coming from, you can just argue. But you know, there's just no argument when the Holy Spirit of God puts the finger on a heart. You know, I've found that one of the best things is just to give people the Word of God, give them the truth of the God, and let the Holy Spirit of God do the convincing. And God's Holy Spirit says to the person, that's true. And I'll say to somebody, it's true, and you know that God's telling you so, don't you? And I've had people say, yes, I have. Yes, I do. And then I'll ask them, would you like to receive the free gift of eternal life? And I've had people say, no. They know it's true. They know God loves them. But they'll say no to the gift of eternal life. Listen to me, my friend. I'll tell you why. Because of something that has a hold on them. Oftentimes it's a relationship, but the relationship really, as we see in our context this evening, is a relationship of fornication. And they realize, they just know. They know, listen, if God saves me, I'm not going to be okay living the way I am. Hear me now. And I'd rather go to hell. I 
mean, that's how it shakes out. That's what the unspoken words mean. Is it not so? I've met believers that are out of fellowship with God, out of fellowship uh, with other Christians. And they're under conviction by the Holy Spirit of God. And what's God's offer to a person who's sinned? If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God offers cleansing. Now, now isn't cleansing a good thing? Isn't fellowship a wonderful thing? Isn't restoration God's plan a wonderful thing? And Christians will say, yes, I know, I believe that. But no. Why? Because of this tool, the Satan, fornication. It's a spiritual thing. It's a major thing. And as I begin to study and look at it, the verse that we read this evening in verse 16 of chapter 6, uh, we saw last week specifically... Paul reminded the believers, Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. Then look at verse 17. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. That means outside the body. But he that commandeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Fornication is an internalized sin. It's a different type of sin than other sin. Now, I'm not saying it has, you know, there, that there are levels of sin. This sin, this sin, this sin, bad sin, good sin, mediocre sin. That's not what the Scripture is saying. What the Scripture is saying, you can do some things that, that do damage outdoors. And then you can do some things that damage you indoors, inside. You ever wonder why so many people are so messed up? Matter of fact, has there been a time that which we've been alive in which people have been more destroyed? Has there ever been more mental sickness than there is today? Not my, not my. You, you say, Pastor, oh, it's always been there. We just, no, my friend, there's more than there's ever been. Yes. Isn't it so? Yes. Do more people have spiritual, mental problems than ever before? And the answer is yes. And I want to tell you, one of the roots to it is right here in the Scripture. Because it's a spiritual sin. It's a spiritual effect. Matter of fact, every false religion incorporates fornication in some way. You say, Pastor, I don't know. Hey, listen, before you argue with me, study. Yeah. Research it. Sometime read the Hadiths. The Hadiths. That's the writings of, of uh, the Islamist. Oh, okay. about Muhammad was illiterate and couldn't write. And so people wrote for him. Oh. And so uh, the Hadiths are the writing of Islamists. Sometime read them. 90%. I'm just making up the, the statistic. It's probably more than that. I'll be honest with you. I just, I just, you know, you're going through it. I'm just like, I don't even need to know this kind of stuff. It's perverted. It's sexually perverted. It's a perverted religion. Yes, what's the attraction in Islam? Do you ever ask that question? Fornication. What is it? Yes, women and fornication. It's okay religiously. What's the attraction of Mormonism? Same thing. It's reinvented, warmed over Islamism. You say, Pastor, you know, that sounds controversial. It's actually not controversial if you've got a brain and you know how to use it. It's factual. It's a fact. Uh, any idolatrous worship, any ism involves fornication. Or, <laughs> uh, well, I don't need to elaborate on that. We went there last week. The reality of it, friend, is that I'm not making. I'm not just making this. This is what the Scripture is implicitly teaching us. This is this is what God wants us to know. It's a spiritual issue. It's a spiritual matter, and that's why it has such, such a deep seated effect. Now, the other thing we saw last week was the importance in the New Testament. Hey, Jesus Christ said, "I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it." Okay, so Jesus is the fulfilling of the law. And one of the things that we see in the early church that was such a struggle was uh, the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers, and the Jewish believers had the expectation that the Gentile believers have now become proselytes of Judaism. And so, yes, they're believers in Jesus, but they're also Jewish. And now they need to come under the law, and they need to, uh, they need to be circumcised, and uh, they need to keep all the laws. And one of the things that was forbidden of the Judaizers was to bring them back under the law again. 
But when the apostles were sent, a delegation were sent to Jerusalem to present this whole matter of do the Gentiles have to keep the law, go to Acts chapter 15 and read it. You'll see that one of the things they were told is they don't have to keep the law, but things offered to idols and fornication. Isn't that interesting? And you study through the Scripture and you see, you'll see fornication was something. Hey, you can do a lot of things as a believer. <coughs> fornication is not one of them. You know, I, 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 let, me, let me retract that statement that you can do a lot of things as a believer. You're not under the law as a believer. Okay, I'm not saying you can sin. I'm not saying sin is allowed, but fornication is a sin that's not. So here's the you know, laundry list of good sins and uh, fornications. The bad one. That is not what I'm saying. So if you'll retract that from your thinking or the way that I presented that, that was not well worded or phrased, and it's not what I intended to say. <laughs> Sometimes you hear things come out of your mouth and you're like, oh, <laughs> that, did, that did not come out the way it should have. That's one of them. Well, anyway, so fornication is a big deal. Now, again, last week we mentioned, you know, this is not a comfortable, uh, this is not a comfortable topic uh, in a mixed group. It's actually not a comfortable topic for me in a uh, group of men, to be quite frank with you. This is not a fun topic. It's not something I'm comfortable talking about because uh, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty graphic in some instances. And then the other concern is children. But I think we've done a disservice to children. See, the education system, the, the government-mandated education system in, in our country forces perversion on our children and teaches them perverted things. And yet we in the church don't teach them what's right. That's right. Well, we don't want to talk about that. Well, friend, do you want them to talk about it? <laughs> mm. You want perverts to talk about it with your children? I think not. And so what we want to say is that there are things which belong only in the boundaries of marriage and only between a man and a woman. And that's where we're at in our text this evening. First of all, the response to fornication was flee. Flee fornication. Pastor, what should I do in order to avoid fornication? <laughs> Anything you have to. Joseph's your example. You want to look at how to flee fornication? Look up Joseph. Mm -hmm. He left his coat and he ran. He went to prison to get away from that woman. <laughs> and we're laughing, but it's not that funny. Really? Why are you here? I fled fornication. Isn't it so? Yeah. Listen, that's God's plan, God's will. And, and what I'll say for you is that, you know, God took pretty good care of Joseph. Mm -hmm. The outcome was pretty good for Joseph. Didn't look good in the outset. But Joseph came out pretty well, and he is our textbook case for how to flee fornication. He fled. You do whatever's necessary. You get things out of your life. If you have to be a fuddy-duddy stick in the mud to flee fornication, you just go right on ahead. You say, Pastor, I'm not comfortable going to the beach because the way people are dressed, it has an effect on me it shouldn't have, and so I'm not comfortable going to the beach. Good for you. Don't go. Uh, you know, Pastor, you know, I just, I look for good things to watch on my television. I just found out there's just not much good, and I just tend to just not turn off things that I should turn off. And so, you know, I'm thinking about getting rid of my television. I encourage you to do so. Flee fornication. You know, the whole smart device, this thing in our hand that is constantly pumping filth at us sometimes, and we don't want a lot of the stuff that comes in on it. I just can't figure out a way to control it. I mean, it seems like it comes up, and, and there I am being sucked in. Well, back in the early days of technology, there was this thing called a flip phone, which was actually pretty incredible for its communication capability. What? And uh, Yeah, this flip phone. <laughs> it doesn't even have to flip. They, they, they got the brick phones, you know, the little bar, the Hershey bars, whatever. Uh, they do have these things. And what I'm saying is this, you'd be better not to be reachable on an instant's notice than to be vulnerable to something that's destroying your life, flee fornication. Now, I'm not setting rules for anyone. I'm not giving you parameters. What I'm saying is flee means get away from. Flee, that's what it means. It's, it's that simple. And the second thing we see to help with fornication is in chapter 7 and verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication. Now, notice the word uh, to avoid is in parenthesis, which means that, uh, that the... the, the 
understanding of that was in the original text. But uh, those extra words were added because we don't have the equivalent word in our language, and so we made the word by adding the meaning, or added the meaning of the word to avoid fornication. Okay, so we're told to avoid fornication, aren't we? And we're told how to avoid fornication. And let me just help you to know how to avoid fornication. And we really start by understanding that in verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, you say, Pastor, I'd like to see that letter they wrote. I would too, to be quite honest with you. I'd like to know what the scenario was or the question that the church at Corinth had for the Apostle Paul. But it seemed like it wasn't a, you know, this person kind of a scenario. It seemed like a church-wide issue, just like it is today. And the Apostle Paul said, Now concerning the things wherever you wrote unto me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, when I was a teenager, I remember uh, an evangelist, uh, this was Tom Farrell, it's not an endorsement of Hammer's ministry or anything like that, just, I just remember this message that he preached, and he'd, he had a growly, like a really, really fast voice, one of those, he, he was like a machine gun, he memorized all of his sermons and just rattled them off, you know, and he'd say, now boys and girls, when the Bible says it is good for a man not to touch a woman, let me help you with the meaning behind that. Let me help you understand what those words mean when the Bible says it is good for a man not to touch a woman. What it means when the Bible says it's good for a man not to touch a woman is that it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And that's what he would say. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. What's that? <laughs> because honestly, thick books are written explaining why it doesn't mean what it says. Which is it always is when there's false teaching or false doctrine is it takes a lot of words uh, to explain away something that's simply written to be understood. Now, if you study the words, the haptomai, the word to touch, here's a word that has to do with glue or being joined to. And it's very, very similar to the word that's actually used in chapter 6 and verse 16, uh, being joined to a harlot. It's similar. It's a different word. It has almost an identical meaning, but it's a different word behind it. And, uh, but we, we certainly understand what being joined to a harlot means in chapter 6, and we understand what it means to touch in chapter 7 and verse 1 means. And so this is how silly uh, this has uh, been played out. I remember people talking about, you know, what does it mean for a man not to touch a woman? What does that mean? Does that mean that if there's incidental contact... We walk out the door and, oh, someone was walking in and I bumped into them and I touched them. That I've broken God's law, I've violated God's law. Well, yes, I think it does for you if you can't figure out things like that. So, actually, I think that's actually what it means for you. Um, so, yes, yes, I think so. Pastor, does that mean that it's wrong for me to hold hands with a woman? Yes, yeah, it does. You say, Pastor, I can't believe that you are so what's, what's legalistic, and uh, that you are yada yada yada. Well, friend, I just want to just want to point something out to you, really, really practically, if I if I please may. It's a slippery slope when you try to uh, get down to the act which is endorsed and that which is not endorsed, isn't it? Mm -hmm. To what degree can I go? Which base is it okay? You want to play that game with God? Is that holiness? See, what's the whole point here? The whole point is that the Scripture says that your body is not your own. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and is supposed to be holy. Now, how much unholiness does it need to defile it? A holy body. How much is, you know... Well, Pastor, you know, kissing. Is, is, is kissing bad... I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> there, see, it seems to exist, doesn't it? And it seems like a right thing, doesn't it? In a right relationship? See, the right relationship is in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. The Bible says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Honorable in all. In other words, what the Bible says is if you're married, it's all good. Honorable. In other words, kissing is an honorable thing in marriage. And that's wonderful, isn't it? 
So is kissing bad? Is holding hands bad? Is affection bad? Positively not. As God intended. Anything else is idolatry. Anything else defiles the temple of the Holy Ghost. And the Scripture is really, really plain about that. Uh, again, brains, common sense, logic. If you're going to approach us and say, what, what am I allowed to do? Whatever you want to. Just go ahead. Is that what God's saying here? This whole idea, how much can I be justified in doing? That's not the point of the Scripture at all. The point of the Scripture is how can I be holy? See. And we as believers want to just set up some parameters so that we can skirt them. Okay, this is bad, so we'll do this. You know, get all the way around without getting to whatever. And you know, friend, that's the wrong attitude, isn't it? See, the whole point is we're talking about something that destroys the soul. Now listen to me. Will you please listen to me for a second? If you had to spend moments, like I do, trying to help people whose souls have been destroyed by fornication, you wouldn't think it's a small matter. If you saw marriages and relationships wrecked years down the line from situations that believers didn't flee from, You'd understand it's a spiritual, serious matter. And this matter of holiness is not something to be taken lightly. It's a serious issue. And the notion that, well, let me figure out how unholy I can be and have God's endorsement, my friend. What kind of an attitude is that? What kind of spirit is that? You realize where you're coming from, where you're going? When that's the question? And so then the Scripture here, again, is very explicit. And it, it says to avoid fornication, let every man uh, have his own wife. And let every woman have her own husband. Again, the word own there is idios. So you get your own idiot. They get their own idiot. And... Uh, <laughs> you don't find that out until you're married, right? <laughs> But uh, let every man have his own wife. Let every woman have her own husband. So God's Word says you have permission. You have permission to have a relationship where that which would be sin is not sin. Where it's sanctioned, it's sanctified, it's holy, it's good. Uh, let the husband render unto the wife do benevolence. Does anybody here know what benevolence is? It's not an implied meaning. It's an actual face value meaning. What's benevolence? If you're benevolent, what does that mean? Generous. Generous and giving. Generous and giving. Let me stop here and say that this book, which is preached by an individual who the world would call a bigot. I'm a bigot. Did you know that? Because I believe the Bible. This book, which is preached by someone the world would call a bigot, is the only book in any religion that says that a woman gets due benevolence and a man gets due benevolence. In other words, this is an equals partnership kind of a relationship in the Scripture. Listen to me. Hear me now. This defied the culture of the day in which a woman was no better than a dog or a mere slave. This defied the culture of the day. The notion that a woman has rights in marriage and a man has rights in marriage. Matter of fact, leaving the Judeo-Christian ethic in this world today, it defies the culture of today. This is not bigoted. This is not closed-minded. This is, don't you take from a woman and don't you take from a man that which only belongs in marriage. That's wrong. Of course, it's a protection, a defense of rights. And I find it rather refreshing myself, do you not? I find that God is one who is not a respecter of persons. Love when the Scripture says that in Christ Jesus there is neither male nor female, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, but the same Lord over all.
same Lord as Lord over all to all those that call upon him. That's a rough misquote of the scriptures, but the gist is there. God is a God who respects women, loves women. God's a God who respects men and loves men. And in marriage, God's way is one that due benevolence is required. It doesn't say, you know, the woman needs to give the man due benevolence. Everything he says, she needs to do. That's what do is in due benevolence. <laughs> do uh, what he says. No, 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 no. That's not what the Scripture is saying. The Scripture is saying... Be benevolent. Friend, this is beautiful. This is beautiful in marriage. For a man to live with his wife according to knowledge. That's really the description here. It's not just a physical relationship. The physical relationship is part of the rights of marriage. But there's more than the physical relationship here. The, the relationship here is respect, courtesy, and benevolence, goodwill. So a man in a relationship with his wife needs to just find out what she wants, desires, and needs and render it. Get it to her. And a woman in marriage needs to find out what a man wants, desires, and needs and render it. And friend, in practice, this makes the marriage relationship unrivaled. I think that perhaps, um, I think that perhaps even a man like King David didn't know about it because of the messed up relationships he had with women. Remember when he said that uh, Jonathan's love for him was better or surpassing love for a woman? There was nothing perverse or disgusting about what he's saying. What he's saying is that, you know, he loved me in a personal way that was better. Uh, than most husband-wife relationships because that, my friend, was the pinnacle of what you could aim at. There, there, there's not a relationship. I, I have some great friendships, but I don't have any friendships like the friendship between myself and my wife. I've never had as close a friendship as, as I've had, as I have with my wife. There's just nothing like it. Anybody that has a good relationship with their wife knows that. I mean, even the innate differences which God has made between male and female make that relationship unrivaled. It's just, it just, there just can't be... Because of the differences between a husband and a wife, the way God's made them, there just can't be a more entwined, uh, close relationship than that. And so this picture that the Apostle Paul is painting for the believer here who is to avoid fornication and to flee fornication is that there is a beautiful alternative. Marriage. This is not a seminar on marriage. I'm not counseling individuals on how to uh, get a married relationship, but I feel as though the topic is talked about too little. Friend, the marriage relationship cannot be practiced at. It is entered in upon by covenant. And that's the reality of this type of a relationship. The covenant of marriage and the honor behind it, coupled with the fact that the Scripture says male and female created he, them, speaking of God, and he made them one flesh. That one flesh relationship, the covenant of marriage, is something so special, so surpassing anything else. And what makes it what it is is the covenant. All the differences between a man and a wife, the mutual attraction, the admiration, the respect, the love, the due benevolence, all fine. But marriage is a spiritual thing. Even a person who's not born again recognizes God in marriage. Lost people who get married recognize the institution that God established. It's a special thing. And here the Scripture is implying, is helping us to understand something about, man, the struggle of fornication. Instead of that, how about this? Which is way higher, which is way better. Now, in our context, and again next week we're going to look at individual calling. And that's really what the, that, what the text that follows after where we're at this evening ends up. 
But uh, I want to just, just kind of work our way through uh, verses 4, 5, and 6. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. And then verse 5, defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now, we are in the boundaries of a context on fornication. So obviously, uh, the overall implied meaning here is a physical relationship that only belongs in marriage between a man and a woman. But the context of benevolence is larger than that as well. Um, <laughs> I hate when my wife goes away. Doesn't happen very often. Happened this year. She babysat her nieces and nephews for a week or something like that. She was gone to Michigan for a week. Left me here with the uh, uh, responsibilities and duties that belong to me. And I hate it when she's gone. I remember when, when uh, I think it was the first year we were married. May, I thought for sure it was in our first year of marriage. Uh, a close friend of hers, uh, really close friends, husband and a wife. The husband got what we think was SARS, severe acute respiratory disease or sickness, and uh, he ended up actually passing away. And while he was in the hospital, it was just a major uh, issue, and they were very alone, needed help. She went up, I know, I want to say it was like two or three weeks. It was a long time that she went to Michigan. And my response to her leaving was that if you know, if I wanted to be alone, I wouldn't have married you. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, Obviously, you know, obviously, in a sense, that was my gift to her friend because I had the right to have my wife with me. Sometimes, uh, some, some years back, some years past, her grandfather had cancer, and while well, he was at different stages of it, she went and just took care of her grandparents. She went and, uh, for periods of time and took care of the household and, and nursed her grandfather in some ways. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I did not enjoy uh, that separation while she was gone. I don't like being separated from my wife. Now, some husbands may be like, woo, freedom! But uh, that's not the way I feel when my wife lays. I'm just like, oh man, this is going to be a mess. This, I'm going to be a mess. And so, you know, that's when I met Betty Crocker, I tell people. Uh, <laughs> during those times, I thought, you know what? I need to do something about this whole cooking thing. And, you know, why cook? Why not bake apple pies? You know, if, if she's not going to be around to stop me from eating things that aren't healthy, then I might as well make apple pie. And so Betty Crocker and I became friends. I memorized some pages in uh, her book and to spend a lot of time with Betty, Betty Crocker while she was gone. <laughs> and uh, if I had a choice if it were not the best thing, in other words, if it weren't needful to do so, she'd have been with me instead of Betty Crocker. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> okay, so hear me now. Listen to this. That was with consent, right? In other words, I need, my family needs me. Okay. All right. I'll hold down the fort while you take care of what needs to be done. And she can tell you about things, I'm sure, uh, that were with consent. Okay. I remember one time I went a couple of weeks on a very, very necessary trip to Alaska. I was helping build an airplane hangar for a missionary. Okay. But it happened to be in Alaska, which for me is not a bad thing. Um, and that was with consent. Or she said, okay, you know, I, matter of fact, I'm sending you. I want you to go to Alaska because I want you to be able to do that. That's with consent. Yeah, you guys understand the with consent. It's a mutual agreement that though this may not be the capstone of what our relationship is, our relationship is about us being together. This is a time when it's right for us, for a cause, to be apart. And so the with consent here is actually a separation. It's more than just, uh, you know, a physical um, 
you know, a, a physical thing while you're together with holding yourselves physically. It's actually more of a every aspect of the benefits of marriage. And I'll just tell you, the great benefit of marriage is, is companionship. A good marriage, a great benefit of marriage is companionship. Everything about marriage is, is wonderful. It really is. And it's, it's just a great privilege. And so, all of it's good, the Bible says. It's wonderful. It's God's thing. It's God's intention. When he made a man, and then he made a woman for the man, and he made them one flesh, God just made it good. And so the defrauding here is the one flesh being not together. That's the idea. Defrauding yourself. Uh, it's every bit as wrong for a husband to not speak to his wife as it is for him to withhold himself in a physical way from his wife. It's defrauding something that she has the right to. There's a bodily, physical aspect, and there's a total aspect of it that has to do with due benevolence. What individuals need from each other is everything in the marriage relationship. And so Paul here says that a way to avoid fornication is to marry. It's an easy way to avoid fornication. You say, well, pastor, I'm for avoiding fornication, so I'll marry you. Uh, find me a wife. Find me a husband. Okay. Let me know. I've got plenty of people emailing me on Facebook. Looking for... <laughs> I can, uh, you can pick your country. I'll get you a spouse. <laughs> do you have any single men in your church? Yes, I do. <laughs> Let me arrange it. Uh, <laughs> you know something? All seriousness aside... <laughs> a committed relationship God's way doesn't need a trial period oh, I, I watch couples agonize as they date trying to figure out is this the one should I marry him should I not marry him I, you know there are stories about it about people that are in relationships for Ten years. And then finally they get married. And it's just like, well, what in the world is that all about? You know, covenant. Make a deal. And get married. You say, Pastor, that won't work. You have to be compatible. No, you have to be right. You have to do right. And it'll work. The problem is most people get married on, on the same basis that they experiment going into it. Well, we're going to find out if this works. Friend, you do it God's way, you render due benevolence, it'll work. If a husband says, you know what? She's going to have everything she needs in a husband. It'll work on his end. And if a wife says he's going to have everything he needs from a wife, it'll work on her end. And guess what? If it works on both those ends, it'll work. And it's been so overcomplicated by the matters we're going to see in the next two weeks. And we'll get into that text. Let's go ahead and conclude our text here. And we'll pray. Father, thank you for what we've seen this evening. And I just pray, Lord, the world is the world is so befuddled on the matter of roles and relationships. There's so much confusion. Yet the Word, your Word, is so plain and simply uh, constructed as to make it very, very clear. And so this evening we acknowledge that what you say is truth. And Lord, I pray that you would help us in a practical way to adapt our thinking to your truth. Lord, help us to be a light to people that don't know how to be able to have victory over these very, very spiritual issues like fornication and about how to have a good marriage. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, before we dismiss this evening, I want to take a, a moment and to take some prayer requests. And uh, while we do that, let me...